For nearly 50 years, the identity of the Lady of the Dunes was a mystery. After being found in July 1974, there were very few leads and uncountable theories about who she could have been. Finally, on October 31st, 2022, her identity was confirmed to be Ruth Mary Terry. This was only one piece of the puzzle. Who killed Ruth and why haven't they been found? Hi everyone. Thanks for stopping by our table of disappointment. This is How They Got Away, the show where we discuss the unsatisfying endings to your favorite unsolved or unpunished true crime and corporate greed stories. I'm your host for today, Annalise. I am here with my co-host. Good mythical morning. It's Kelsey. Hopefully that just get us copyrighted. <laughs> just rip off of the channel. <laughs> Um, um, you can't do, you cannot, yeah, I don't think you, I don't think we can get away with that one. I do, I do not think we are allowed to get away with that one, but hello everyone, good morning, this is Anna. So, the case that we're covering today is very famous among true crime circles, and thanks to the recent discoveries, it has been brought into the limelight once again. We've actually been hearing about Buzzfeed did this one, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They did. Um, I almost watched the episode like to prep, but I was like, no, I won't. I won't. <laughs> I think most true crime channels or podcasts or media have covered this case. We've been hearing a lot about Jane and John Doe cases being identified recently, which I'm very happy about. We also had the boy in the box be identified recently. So there's a lot of cases that we can kind of dig back through and come and look at it with a new lens, which is what I'm hoping to do today. I think it goes to show how important it is to bring back old cases now that modern t technology and forensic science is constantly updating to just take a second to see if you can find more information out because I think a lot of us just kind of resign a lot of these stories to forever unsolved when that may not be the case. For sure. <sighs> So without further ado, let's start at the very beginning with the discovery. On July 13th, 1974, a girl who was about 12 or 13 was searching around Race Point Dunes in Provincetown, Massachusetts, searching for her dog, who I had to know oh, no. it was a beagle, just so you all know. <laughs> Following the dog's oh, no. barks, the girl found a woman Aww. laying face down about a hundred yards into the dunes. Can you imagine this woman, you're 12, 13, maybe you're on vacation with your family. I don't know. You're just having a day at the beach and then you go chasing after your dog and you just find a dead body. Like that's got a, I'm not saying it's a childhood ruiner, but like, oh man, that's gotta suck. I also read another article where a lady claimed to have found the body earlier but she was really young at the time and it scared her and so she didn't say anything fair enough fair enough though wow so, kind of similar to what we heard with the bearbrook murders how there was a couple kids messing around with those barrels and then they just kind of ran away um they just don't know what to do when they find a body, and they shouldn't know what no. to do. That's That shouldn't be, like, a thing that happens for kids. Yeah, that is a totally, like, I give kids a pass. If you find something and, like, you're spooked out and don't even say anything, we get it. We understand. It's not great because it would be helpful to find these things earlier, but also, if you're, like, 10 and you're running around and you're like, oh, saw something I shouldn't, we get it. So this woman was naked, and upon first look, the girl thought that she was just sunbathing, but it became apparent after a closer look that this woman was, in fact, dead. The girl went to get help, and police came. Four hours later, the woman's body had been removed. So today... By police, or just like they got there and it was gone? By police, sorry. No, the police okay. came and they after four hours, removed the body, kind of took play of the scene. Sorry. Wasn't worded quite well. <laughs> Bro, she's gone. Now we know today, again, after almost 50 years, that this woman is Ruth Mary Terry. But like I mentioned at the top, we did not know this <laughs> for a very long time. And at this point in the story, we did not know that yet. So here are some 
crime scene details. So there was no sign of a struggle. A blue bandana and a pair of jeans were under her head. Part of a green towel that she was laid on was folded over to cover her face. Previously, smaller details were also made public in hopes that it might help identify her. For example, her jeans were specifically for the brand Wrangler. Her hair was pulled up in a ponytail with a gold elastic, and her toenails were painted pink. Getting very that's not very small details in hopes that though. anything. It's not really, but at that point, you're kind of desperate to figure this out. So if anything will spark some kind of recognition, you want to put it out there. That's true, but I also have to wonder, like, how many people were like, oh, I know a person who paints yeah. their toenails pink and I just, like, haven't seen them for the last 24 hours. And this was 50 years ago. It's not like you can give them a quick text and be like, hey, you're not dead, right? If they don't answer the home <laughs> phone, like, they might as well be dead. They're gone. They had also talked about how she had expensive dental work done and they had hoped that this would help identify her, including crowns that were estimated. So in total, it was estimated to be about 5K to 10K worth of work. So a lot. For 5 to 10K for the time? Ooh, I can't remember. Sorry. <laughs> you asked Sorry. me that. That's right. I, That's right. I was going to go like, that's how a lot of dental places kind of charge now if you don't have insurance which kind of sucks or at least granted um i'm only talking about a certain big name dental place that begins with an a and ends with an n but it kind of yeah. depends but that's huh what she get her teeth done for to look nice to feel nice well yeah but like sometimes you have complicated stuff in your mouth and they're just like well something's messed up in there time to go work on it because sometimes dentists like to exploit that. She was initially listed as five foot eight, but was actually five foot six, uh, for 145 pounds with an athletic build. At the time, estimations for her age put her around 25 to 40 years old. Um, I believe she was actually about 38 when she passed. So she was in that range. And age is like now, can be one of the hardest determined factors to determine, right? That's why the big range. Yeah. Although, like, how do you? I, I'm not quite sure what the state the body was in at the time of discovery, but how do you like lose two inches when measuring? Like, what what happened? Um. Well, let let's let's get to some of the gruesome bits that we can actually. That's a good a lot of cases have that and i really couldn't tell you but like it would make sense if they were skeletal and you're like not quite sure how the person carried themselves that could be a factor in height but like if i if i remember the case well enough like she was still pretty fleshy i'm going with that one yeah so she like wasn't you, super like a measure tape that's that's just a very weird detail sorry go ahead so let's get into some of the more gruesome details. Oh boy. Ruth had been nearly decapitated with one side of her head crushed. It was Okay, so that might explain that the had... last two inches. That's what I was also thinking about, but I was like, That'll we do gotta, it to you. let's get into this part. <laughs> oh boy. It was theorized that she had possibly been strangled and then an entrenching tool may have been used to crush her skull. Like a shovel? Is that what an yeah, entrenching tool is? Yeah, it's like a shovel, but is? it's like, it's like, you know, like the shovel head, it's almost like it's perpendicular. And then you kind of, anyway, you can push it into the ground. Oh, uh, okay. Anyway, yeah, yeah. It, it's a weird shovel is what we can call it. The weird shovel. <laughs> For sure. Mm. Um, the head injury was determined to be the cause of death. Several of her teeth were removed. Both her hands and one of her forearms were also removed and missing oh. from the scene. Some investigators 
and I think this is plausible, believed that the killer removed the teeth and hands as a way to hide Ruth's identity as well as their own. Which makes sense. What about and those particular teeth? Worked. Huh? What? Like, what about, like, what? You murder someone. Not a great start. You go to dismember the body to make it difficult to identify. Not great, but I get it. And then you open the mouth, and instead of just smashing all the teeth, which we've seen in other cases, they took out specific teeth? What about those teeth? We're like, mm, they'll know who she is from that one. Her canines, they are unique. I mean, fillings and such. Yes. That's just so weird. Like, why wouldn't you just smash the teeth? I mean, that's true, but that's also... It's a lot of I work. I mean, clearly <laughs> they tried to decapitate her. Like, they tried to do yeah. that, and that didn't yeah. work. So maybe there was just, like, they panicked and just started doing whatever. Sure. And it also could be, oh I mean, God. as mentioned, we don't know who killed Ruth for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some killers who also just take teeth as trophies. That was my other thought. That's true. <laughs> what a strange but little flex. It seems plausible that they might have just kind of tried to get rid of hands for fingerprints, take out some teeth just to make it a little more confusing, but didn't want to stay at the scene for too long. That's the thing, like know. pulling out an adult, an adult tooth, like there's the whole root system underneath, like that's not easy. What is he doing with that with the entrenchment tool? Like, did he bring pliers? I don't what know. What the hell? What is happening? I could not Probably. tell you what's going through this person's head. On a beach in the dunes, this man, I assume it's a man, I don't know that, but you know, is just ripping specific teeth out. I mean, I guess it could make sense if it was somebody who was taking a trophy. You would take the time if it was for that. But wow. There was also, and this is really gross. <laughs> oh, God. Signs of sexual assault, likely after she had passed. Oh, I wish that was shocking. It's disappointing, but it's not shocking. As mentioned before, there was no sign of a struggle. So police theorized that she either knew her killer or was asleep at the time that she was attacked. Yeah, I mean, she could have been tanning and then somebody just came up and attacked her. It's plausible. Again, as we said over and over, it took a long time for Ruth to be identified, but there are a number of theories about who she might have been. Um, I'm not going to get into too many of them, but I will get into one of the more popular ones online, which comes from Joe Hill, a ghostwriter and son of Stephen King. He, sorry, I just said ghost story writer, not ghost writer. In I, oh, thing. I was going to say like. Uh, I was to say, what an interesting Ghost career writer. path for the son of a like known horror writer to just be like, yeah, but I'm going to write for other people. <laughs> so he had theorized that she may have been an extra in the Jaws movie. I remember this. Jaws was filmed in Martha's Vineyard off of Cape Cod in the same summer that she died. Hill made a blog post to Tumblr in 2015. To Tumblr. About, Tumblr. <laughs> about how this woman looked like the composite images, how the clothes were similar to those found with her, and how when watching the movie, he was just kind of suddenly struck by it. He did state in interviews that there's probably nothing to this theory, um, but he had hoped that this would get the case some more attention. I will real quick share with you a side by side of the extra that we're talking about and the composite image. So on the left for us is the extra. Um, if you guys look it up, you could just look up Lady of the Dunes Jaws. It's with like a blue bandana. Um, and the one I have next to it is the one, the composite I have next to it is the composite from <laughs> missing exploited children with the green background but 
they really doubled down on that very interesting hairstyle for the composite. Like she's got this like high roller victory rolls kind of top for the ponytail. And then it's just like a normal low ponytail from there. That's like, that was a artistic choice. I mean, maybe <laughs> the bump it before the bump it. Yeah. yeah it kind of looks like that. Oh, I can't, I can't really say if they look, they're the same though. Like, yeah, she's in similar clothes, the blue bandana, but, like. It's very generic um, Caucasian woman with brown hair. You can't tell. She's too far away. It's it's too far away. It's a little bit blurry. Um, It it looks very generic. And, I mean, the composite images are always kind of slightly generic as well um, in some aspects to try and paint the largest field possible so yeah it could be but not it's not it could also case. just be a <laughs> random caucasian woman with brown hair like it could be anybody yeah. really yeah um hill also made a note that he would like to see her dna submitted to a geological database which is essentially how it happened and how she was identified. So let's get into that. Yippee. On October 31st, 2022, the Lady of the Dunes was finally identified to be Ruth Mary Terry thanks to investigative genealogy conducted by Orthrum and the FBI. We've talked about this process previously with the Buffalo Cave John Doe, But essentially what this company did is that they used programming to build a DNA profile from the skeletal remains. The FBI then used this profile to conduct a genealogical DNA search, which is how they got to a close relative. After getting confirmation with official DNA testing with that relative, they were able to confirm that Ruth was the Lady of the Dunes. And if I recall correctly, this kind of DNA testing is done through the mRNA strain that you have, which is passed down directly from your maternal line unchanged, which is why you can find so many relatives, but it's only maternal relatives that this works with. So if you're like uncle from your dad's side submitted DNA, like, I don't think this process would be helpful in that case. Unless you have your dad's mom's dna (laughs) it's a tangled web of dna (laughs) we understand so little about it it's so interesting how more info comes out like every couple of years and you're like oh didn't know it worked that way but okay it is so interesting um but let's talk a little bit about ruth and before we get into that i also want to show you a picture of ruth so we have an idea of who we're talking about if i can pull up the correct one Here we go. There's just a couple of pictures here from like different parts of our ride, but that's Ruth. Oh. Um, I would say the picture top two, the the top right ones kind of look like the composite. Mm Mm-hmm. There is, it kind of lines up. It does line up for a a lot of these pictures and you can see they got pretty close with the composite, I think. Hmm. There's a picture of her with a dog, which is very cute. Um, one that looks like she might have been, I don't know, at a fair or something. There's like a lot of posters behind her head. It's black and white, but she has a very nice smile. She looked happy in these pictures. But let's get into a little bit about her. Ruth was born on September 8th, 1960. 19- 36 to her father Johnny and mother Ava in Whitwell, in Whitwell, Tennessee. Her mother sadly passed away when she was very young. Her mother was only 23 when she died. Oh. At around oh, 19 darn. years old, Ruth left Whitwell to move to Livonia, Michigan, where she would work at the Fisher Body Automotive Plant. In 1958, she gave birth to her son Richard. She was unable to provide a stable life to him due to her financial situation. So Richard was actually adopted by her superintendent from her workplace. Richard. That's interesting. They must have been close. Yeah. But I have to wonder, though, like, 
you said she had a son, but she wasn't married. And at the time, it was still a little bit of a social. She was iffy. married briefly before and then divorced. Oh. So I'm not honestly sure where this pregnancy fell in line with that. I was just wondering, like, maybe the superintendent was, like, the father and just didn't want to say or something. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. because just well, a actually, nice guy. <laughs> Richard didn't know much about his biological family, so he had taken, like, a DNA test in 2018. And I don't think that said anything about his adoptive parents. So I think it was just... One of those case scenarios. I saw other articles that said um, Richard was taken in by friends. So I'm just wondering if the superintendent was friends. So. so they're just nice and close. That's nice. Yeah. So that way she could still mm -hmm. see him, but like when he would have a stable home life. But she didn't really. After Richard was adopted, she moved out to California. Aww. Years passed, and around 1972, Ruth reached back out to Richard. Um, she had wanted to reconnect, but at this point, he was a teenager and had actually been in a coma for 18 days due to a drug overdose. And so he wasn't in the place where he was ready to reconnect with her, because he already had a lot going on in his life. Oh my um, god. Yeah. He says... Because Richard has been interviewed for some of these, obviously, now that this has all mm -hmm. come out. Um, he talks about how this is, like, one of his big regrets in life. Is that he wished that he would have taken the time to reconnect with her then. But I don't blame him. He had a lot going on. And I almost wonder if his drug problem was related to his mom leaving him at such a young age, too. Like, that could totally be putting words in his mouth that could be unrelated. But, like... That is an emotionally wrought time. It's the 70s as well. So I also have that kind of mind frame of like 70s drug culture. So it could mm, also be yeah. unrelated, but I'm not going to claim to know anything about his mental health or anything like that. Mm. On February 16th, 1974, Ruth married an antiques dealer in Reno, Nevada. This was a gentleman named Guy Rockwell Moldavin. Her family said that Ruth was different around him and that he exhibited possessive behaviors. They suspected that he may have been abusive. During a visit with her half-brother Kenneth, the couple mentioned that they were traveling around the country looking for antiques and were leaving for Massachusetts. Of course, we know what happens in Massachusetts. Later that summer, so the summer of, again, 1974, this is all in the same year, um, Guy went back to Tennessee and told her family that Ruth had gone missing from their home in California. And he so didn't that's stay bullshit. for long. Yeah, and he didn't stay for long, and he didn't give any more information he just said he didn't know where Ruth was and then left. Hi, guys. No, I haven't seen your daughter. She actually disappeared. No, I didn't report it. Anyway, bye. I'll never see you again. What the fuck? Uh, see you later, in laws. I'm out of here. <laughs> Ruth's brother, James, went out to California and hired a private investigator. This PI told him and his family that all of Ruth's belongings had been sold and that she had willingly left to join a religious cult, which sounds very 1970s. Um, Ooh, so that's does. kind of believable, but that is not what happened here. <laughs> Carol, a sister-in-law, had theorized that Ruth was in the witness protection program which would be why she hadn't contacted her family. And of course, again, we know that this is not the case. And her family was left without answers for decades. So your options as the family are, she left to join a religious cult, never spoke to us again. She went missing and is gone 
and we'll never see her again. Or, and you know, they haven't, they didn't discover this for, I think a few more years by that support, this point in the timeline, she's dead. And that's terrible. And we'll never speak to her again. Or alternatively, she just doesn't want to see us ever again. Like the different, the, there's so many options for families of a missing person, like to think of what could have happened. And none of them are good. No. Like the best case scenario is that your loved one left and never wants to see you again. And that's the best case scenario. So now I'd like to get into some of the suspects. Obviously, we're going to talk one, more about her husband. boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, they we're, were gonna married. Talk about him. But I did want to touch on three of the more well-known suspects from before she was identified. One of the earlier, one of the early popular suspects for Ruth's murder was a mobster named James Whitey Bulger. Little Jimmy Bulger Vulture. was seen with a woman. Jimmy the Vulture. Bulger was seen with a woman that fit Ruth's description in July of 1974 in Provincetown. Um, and apparently, he was known for pulling teeth from his victims. All right. Case closed. <laughs> That's so specific. I was just about to say being seen with a white woman with brown hair does not a case make. Never mind. I'm feeling pretty good about good old Jimmy. He's an interesting character. I'm not going to get too much into his past, um, but he was suspected back to then when they didn't know who Ruth was. There's very, very little connecting him to this case. Um, Bulger was actually murdered in prison in 2018. So even if he oh. did know something, we're not going to get anything from him now. It's very loose threads. It is, but if he was attached to the mob, like, there doesn't necessarily need to be a very strong connection. It could be as simple as she was walking around at night and saw something that she shouldn't have on the beach, and he's the cleanup guy. Like, it could be as simple as that. It's also suspicious, though, that the area she was in didn't look like she was, there was a struggle. Mm, true. So it, it would have to be an interesting set of circumstances in order to get that to align. And I think really police and people just knew that he was a known character in the area and then immediately attached it to him. I mean, if you find a body that is missing teeth and then you know good old mobster Jimmy is in town and he just has a whole jar full of teeth at home. Like, I feel like I would also make that connection. That is, I'm not over that. That's so specific and weird, but I agree that like, it doesn't make sense given the lack of struggle and what we know about her sketchy, sketchy husband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next suspect is Tony Costa, who was a serial killer that was suspected of killing eight women around 1969. However, he was only ever convicted for two murders. This man is wild. Um, I found a timeline of his life, and at one point he married a 14-year-old girl. Ew. Amongst oh my just God. other crazy things. Costa <laughs> was born in Provincetown, and some of his victims were in the area as well as in Massachusetts and California. I think I want to get more into his whole deal in another episode, but why I'm ruling him out, he died on May 12th, 1974. So he wouldn't have been able to kill Ruth in July. He was dead. He was ghost murdering. (laughs) <laughs> they really were like, oh my god, this one, this one, looks at when he died. Never mind, I take it back. He's already no. dead. <laughs> I could see why if there's a serial killer in the area and he was only convicted for two, that still leaves a little bit of doubt for the other six. Like, if there were more, if there was another serial killer that was operating in the area. 
But yeah, he kind of needs to be alive to kill people. <laughs> that is a requirement. Yeah. Yeah, he was very quickly ruled out. <laughs> the third suspect is Hayden Clark, another serial killer, who actually confessed to killing Ruth in 2000, when she was still known as the Lady of the Dudes. Clark had already been in prison for killing a six-year-old girl and a 23-year-old woman in 1992. Clark went on a confession spree and claimed to have killed 11 other women. He also suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, which has been known to lead people to make false confessions. And in we know that the other women he confessed to, he did not kill? I, I have not seen anything else about the other cases being confirmed. Okay. I know there was so one case where he led maybe. police to the right area, but the other ones, it's just, it sounds like he kind of threw a net out and confessed to killing a bunch of people. In 2004, he sent a letter to a friend containing... <laughs> really disturbing drawings um one of what is likely meant to be ruth naked and handless and a second one of a map pointing to the crime scene in this letter he again stated that he killed her clark is a sick sick man um i don't think he committed this particular crime because it really does sound like he just kind of confessed to heard a about it stuff. yeah it sounds like he wants it too bad like the drawing gross disgusting send it to a friend okay i could see a disgusting serial killer doing that but then including a map with the drawing of where the crime took place with like a little arrow of like i killed this lady here like that that seems like a little too much to me for it to be true like he wants it too badly which I'd never thought I'd have to say about a murder, but you know. So let's talk about the most popular suspect today. Guy Moldavin, Ruth's husband. Yeah. Moldavin also goes by multiple aliases, including Raul Rockwell. Moldavin had been married, from what I saw, eight times during his life. It was actually suspected of killing his second wife, Manzanita Aileen Ryan, and his stepdaughter, Dolores Ann Mearns, after they went missing on April 1st, 1960, from Seattle, Washington. Wow. Sounds like a real stand-up dude. I can totally see what Ruth saw in him. <laughs> hmm. In July of that year, he claimed desertion and divorced Manzanita, again, witnessing in April, divorced her in July, and then married a new woman, Evelyn Emerson. Okay. Hmm. Police investigated- Maybe just don't get married. It really doesn't seem to be for him, but you know, okay. Police investigated his former home where he lived with Manzanita, and they found bits of human tissue and body parts in the newly sealed septic tank. Very normal, very chill, very normal. No reason to be suspicious about that. Hmm. Moldavin had attempted to leave Seattle only five days after marrying Evelyn Emerson with the money that he had gotten from his stepmother to buy antiques in Canada. He was arrested by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid testimony. Guess what? Nothing happened. From okay, what I, I can find tell, it so interesting that he can't stick to a wife, but consistently sticks to his hobby of antique collecting. <laughs> There's something very funny to, about that to me. He really went like, I'm going to disrespect yeah. women, but I love antiques. God, I just love the antiques. I don't respect women. I'm a player. I'm a murderer. But is that a Baroque piece? <laughs> <laughs> I love to kill. Really I love to disrespect ball. women. Oh my god, is that from the Renaissance? <laughs> Hand that over. 
That's so goofy. <laughs> From what I can tell, the case of Manzanita Aileen Ryan and Dolores Ann Burns hasn't been solved, nor were the body parts in the septic tank ever confirmed to be either of theirs. And I, I have to ask the question because it's the 60s and they have very Latin sounding names. <laughs> I have to wonder if they were of Latin descent and maybe the police just didn't care quite as much to solve their case. I couldn't tell you. And honestly, there's very little that I could find on their case. A woman and child go missing. Body parts in the septic tank. Don't worry about it, none though. We won't look into it. As we talked about before, Guy married Ruth in the 1970s and then reported her missing in 1974, saying she disappeared from California, which is entirely untrue and would not line up at all, and then kind of washed his hands of it. Um, I also wanted to note that he published a really weird book in 1976 called Cooking with Rump Oil, um, which some people what? have described as disturbing. It has a weird story in it called Cape Cod Shid. Um, it's really bizarre. <laughs> There's really not much else to say about it. Cooking with rump oil? Rump oil, yeah. What? Uh, yeah, it's so what? weird. And I'll show you a page from... It's just looks so funny. Um, like, is he trying to go like very avant garde artsy with this? That's the Cape Cod Shid page. Did he draw that? I can only guess. I don't know who would have collaborated with him on this. Huh. Out, out of the water and into the pan, the only way to cook the Shid. After this shit is caught, anything over five minutes ends it. That's specific, okay. The sweet turpentine taste will turn that... I don't know what that is. Turn that O-F... Of a... Of a... I can read. I can't. That of a burnt glove and the tender look will become one of despair... Remember just five minutes? What the <laughs> hell is this? Is it a confession? It feels like a confession. The five minutes is freaking me out. It's just creepy, and I really couldn't tell you much about it. Everyone who talks about this guy, talks about this case, mentions this book, and it just says that it's bizarre, and that's about it. And yeah. from a quick Google, shit is not a thing. Like, I thought maybe it was like a weird kind of fish. It's not. S-H-I-D is nothing but maybe like a misspelling of shit. That's the only thing I could think it could be was the, just saying shit instead just of shit. Just five. Don't cook the shit out of it. What does that mean? I don't know. Yeah, it's I can only think it's essentially him saying shit. That there's like a face with long hair here. Oh, I didn't even see it that way, but now I see it. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, that's really disgusting. I feel... I know what I said about good old Jimmy. I'm going to rescind that. I'm... We done it, folks. We found the guy. Actually, you know what? Theory. Maybe... I don't think he would because he seems like that poem seems so gross and specific and weird. But I'm also like, I've been percolating on the maybe the husband paid Jimmy Costa to murder his wife. Like, he does not seem the person who would be above that. You mean Jimmy Bolger? Because the teeth thing is specific too. Yeah. It is. Specific. Sorry. Yeah. Jimmy Vulture. Well, I guess his name is his name is James Whitey Bulger, but we've given him a nickname. He's Jimmy. No, now. we're friends. He's Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy. We're good friends um, with the teeth guy. But again, besides this being just really bizarre and weird, there's really not much else to say about that book. Like that's like a collection of poetry. There's like more in that book, presumably. Yeah, there's more in that book. It's just weird stories like that. 
the five minutes and the like tender to one of despair. Oh my God. We did it. We did it. We found the guy. We did it. And you know what? It was a serial killer because I'm going to call that guy a serial killer because there's, I'm pretty sure you murdered that woman and her child too. So I also want to mention um, I've seen Moldavin mentioned as a prime suspect for the murder of a man named Henry Lawrence Baird and the disappearance of his girlfriend, Barbara Joe Kelly, who is still missing today. Um, and that hmm. case is from June 1950, but I could not find a reputable source for it. It was listed in the comments of some, some articles, and it's listed on the wiki as well, but it doesn't connect to any strong sources that are in any way reputable. But I thought I'd mention it in case people went digging and thought of it. This is the kind of case that makes you wonder how anybody survived the 60s to the 80s because of how many serial killers were just running around. Like, there are three in this case alone. And it could have been any of them, really. I think we know who it was, but it really could have been any of them. Oh, my God. Um, sadly, we're not going to get any more information from Moldavin on any of these no. cases because he died in 2002 at 78 years old. Oh, the coward. <laughs> Live to 98 and suffer. It really tragic that it took this long to identify ruth a lot of the suspects have died i think most of almost all of the suspects we've talked about have died which makes it exponentially harder to solve this case if any of these suspects are the true killer the steps her killer took to obscure her identity sadly worked and detrimentally hindered the investigations from the knowledge that we currently have and what we've talked about, I really do believe that her husband killed her, and or if not, was somehow involved in this. Oh, yeah. Um, and if he did do this and was involved, um, he'll never have to pay for his crimes. And that infuriates me. Just, like, was divorce a thing in the 70s? I mean, it doesn't matter. He abandoned I mean, his was, other wife. You couldn't just abandon her. Like, that's terrible, too. But, like, did you have to kill her? Um, I can't remember if this is the time where you had to give a reason for divorce or not. And someone had to be the guilty party. Mm. Oh, but my either God. way, uh, th this man's suspicious. What the hell? Stinky little guy. I can't get the poem out of my mind. That is so nasty, disgusting. And the drawing with, I think you're right. I think that's like a woman's head, like looking up at somebody. Oh, oh man. I just had the really what if that's how image. she looked at him? Oh. Yeah. She like looked up at him as he walked towards her and then he just killed her. That's horrible. Cause he had to, like, he had an entrenchment tool. Nobody brings that to the beach. He had to bring that with the intent of doing this to her if it was him. And the fact that they theorize that it's someone she knew because there wasn't a struggle. Oh, my God. Oh, that's going to be in my head for the rest of the day. It makes a lot of sense to me that it would have been this man. And he the reminds just me. just five minutes part. Do you think he might have, like, timed it? And that's why he emphasizes the five minutes. He's like, I did this in five minutes. Exactly. Like, at Ooh. least killing her. Gross. Because blood trauma, That'd like, a lot. Pulling teeth, he could do that after. But I'm just like, ugh. That's so scary. This man also kind of makes me think of um, Rasmussen from the Bear Books murder case. Mm. I was Rasmussen thinking of that. It sounded very multiple, similar. Yeah, he had multiple wives who, and girlfriends who he killed. He went back and forth between the two coasts. This guy also did that. He went from California to Massachusetts to Nevada. He was moving around a lot. It's very similar and it's very creepy. Well, sadly, that's all I have for today. So thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for sitting at our table of disappointment. I like to imagine that we were in, you know, those like um, 
classic sunrooms you get on like in coastal towns where like you have like a little seat and there's the beach. I'd like to imagine oh, we were sitting at one of those. On the Cape. <laughs> uh, staring at the uh, beach like wicker chairs. Mm. Painted white wicker chairs specifically. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. With those kind of like um patterned, maybe blue seat cushions. The yes. table that's wicker but has the glass on it. Oh he he. Yes. Did we have the same grandparents? <laughs> I think all grandparents have the same kind of furniture. <laughs> all New England Cape Cod grandparents' houses look the same. And Michigan grandparents' houses. <laughs> Gorge. Oh, God. I'm going to be thinking about that poem for the rest of this day. At least she got her name back. Yeah. I am That's very a, happy that we've like identified her. Helpful. And that has brought this man to light because he wasn't even thought of before this. Before they knew who I she mean, how was. would he have been? So, like, he wasn't connected, just, yeah. just an unknown woman. Yeah. So. Oh, man. Thanks for stopping by. Pushing your chair before you leave. And <laughs> try not to think about that poem too much. <laughs> just five minutes, Annalise. Oh, um, God. We'll see you in the next one, guys. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye.